Uh, welcome to the session about IoT and the enterprise. Um, let me start by introducing myself. Um, Alex is going to come and tell you that. Yeah. So my name is Ingmar Rahai. I work at Citrix. But today I'm a PDO, which means that I'm a lead. So this is my vacation. So I will be talking personally about IoT. I'm from the Netherlands, hence the crazy accent. Um, I used to start the user group in the Netherlands with a bunch of friends. Um, I'm an Apple fanboy, uh, uh, IoT is a hobby, and well, if I'm not working on this stuff, then I'm either on a mountain bike or, or, or hanging around with my family. I was supposed to do the session together with Case, Case Bakamon from Nutanix, uh, but well, he had to travel so much lately that he decided to stay at home, so I'll be doing it all on my own today. Um, oh. No, oh. I'll manage. Okay. <laughs> somehow. Don't, somehow, somehow. You guys will. So IoT. Um, whenever I talk to people about IoT, uh, they always think in drones and LEDs and flame sensors, alcohol sensors, and I know I've been contributing to this as well. <laughs> that, that's what I did in Lisbon. But IoT really is valuable in as well. So that's why I wanted to do another session about IT after the session in Lisbon. Uh, this one really is, is about IT and enterprise. Um, so I want to show you that there's value for me, for you, uh, for your customers. So you do something with IT or start thinking about IT. So yeah, IT is in numbers is huge. According to the numbers from Gartner, um, only in 2015 the amount of spending in the IoT space was roughly $1.1 billion. And if you look at how it's divided between consumer and enterprise, you can see that 65% roughly is in the business already, not in the consumer space, even though we all see the consumer space, more or less. So there's already a lot of focus, a lot of things happening in IoT and enterprise or in business. And these numbers are growing rapidly to big, big numbers. <laughs> But every IT session is about those numbers. They're all from Gartner, from Intel. And I wonder how relevant are all those numbers for us, for those in the room who are working, you know, it's in Brinks, RES, end user computing space. How relevant are those numbers? He agrees, right? So, what is it that we do in IT? And I've been thinking about what have I been doing the well, the last years in IT. Um, I've been have one, I've been helping my customers by being more successful. They need IT to do their job. It's not the other way around. We do not exist because we exist. We exist because companies need us to do their job better, more efficient, whatever. And two, our job has mainly been automating stuff. And we are automating stuff to make things better for users because they don't have to do all the steps. And we're automating because we're lazy. A good it -er is lazy. So if we have to do things twice, let's automate it so we don't have to do it again. Being lazy does not make you good in IT. It's the other way around. So uh, for those who know the series, um, very good. As they show, you can automate everything, including you have tried turning it off and on again and on again. So we've been automating for years, and IoT is all about automation. And for Citrix, IoT is more about the integration. <coughs> and it's easier said than, than done. It's easier to say, well, you know, we can integrate everything with each other. But that's really where the foundation is. We can automate across products. We can automate across solutions. Um, and that's what we can do with the solutions that we are now building and acquiring. So one of the things we did is we acquired Citrix. <coughs> And OctaBlue is an IoT platform. IoT is not so much a IoT device or a sensor or a solution. It is an IoT platform. So what it does, and I like to walk around, so I'm sorry Alex, if you see the video, I'm walking around. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, as it said, this is too soon. OctaBlue enables you to connect <coughs> everything, read everything, right? So the IoT platform allows you to connect those things. And the way it does it, to make an analogy, if we have two people here, right, 
won't speak Greece or Japanese, I have no clue what's happening here. Okay, unless you speak Greece. George is not in here? No. No, see, he, he should read this. In order to um, let them to talk, we need a translator so that they speak a universal language and they both will say, hey, I'm a language, I'm a, I'm a student, very good. Actually, the translation according to Google Translate. So I guess it's right. Right, so the translator is in the middle allowing some more countries to talk to someone like Japan or whatever language they're talking, the translator will make sure that, that happens. If we look at machines or computers or devices, they also speak a language. Hopefully they're talking some sort of an API. The fact that you're talking an API doesn't mean that the one can talk to the other because it's all different. It's a different language, it's a different interpretation. So again, you need a translator in the middle to achieve this. For Octoblue, that's MeshBlue. MeshBlue is what's in the middle between all those devices, sensors, components, services, and it speaks now, like six different API languages, which are more or less all the API languages which exist within IoT and the last two just been added. So you could see MeshBlue as the Google Translate for machine-to-machine -machine communication, right? That's what it does. It takes an API, does some magic with it, and sends it out <coughs> to another API, a different language. If you do not have where you have a device or a sensor or something which does not speak API directly or an component is protocol, <coughs> then we're building a MeshBlue device. And basically what a MeshBlue device does, it translates whatever the product does into one of those six APIs. So we're helping them talk a more universal language. So as an example, I did a blog post a few months ago where I talked about Citrix Secure Forms or back then it was Works Forms. And I did a submitted the form, that form went to, into Octoblue and posted a, created the task in Podio. And you should know that Secure Forms, even though it's from Citrix, does not know who or what Podio is. No clue. The only thing what it knows is I can post via HTTP REST a JSON file, which is structured data, and that's what it does. It just sends the JSON data and uh, do something with it. MeshBlue translates that. It, has a, a workflow in there, and it looks at the API from Citrix Podio and creates the task. <coughs> so even though those two are never made to work with each other, even though it's on Citrix, um, they, they can't uh, talk to each other. And that's what this machine machine messaging does. So those mesh blue devices, we're building a lot of them, because most components don't directly install uh, an API. So for instance, Citrix, for Citrix products, there are a lot of things or devices which are available in Octoblue. You can simply drag and drop those components onto your, your flow editor and start connecting them to other devices. So there are a lot of Citrix things available. Uh, and as you can see, there's a mobile, there's uh, a Netscaler somewhere in there, there's a director, there's a receiver, a lot of go-to products which, well, within a few months are no longer Citrix. We'll move to Gecko or some other name there, which you can. And there are a lot of more devices available. So you don't have to actually do something with APIs. We're doing it for you. And then this is the architecture to remember. If you want to remember an architecture, this is it. MeshBlue is in the middle. It's green, which means it's open source. You can contribute to it. Um, Octoblue is the part where you actually build the stuff. That's the web form. That's where you do the drag and drop that provided. And you can connect all types of services, components, etc. in there. So even if you have components which run on-premises, or on-premise, on-prem, who cares about it? <laughs> There's a gateway. In your data center. Yes, in your data center. Um, so we're helping you getting all the messages from whatever is either in your data center, in your office, somewhere in the cloud, to orchestrate them at these messages. So Octoblue is the orchestrator of all this, what happens, right? And MeshBlue is the Google Translate, which we need to solve APIs. This is the theory which we've got. So, with the theory in our minds, let me give you a few of those examples where I think 
we with Citrix, we had Octoblue, can add value for either you, your customers, or things which are related to our day-to-day -day job. So no uh, alcohol sensors or stuff which is cool to show, but this time it's really, really relevant for what we do. One of those examples is, I'll come back to the camera for a <coughs> One of those examples is, as of um, Zen Desktop 7.7, 7, in Director, I'm a second one, that's the studio. In Director, we can see the our environment. High healthy is our environment, right? And there's a new feature, it's called Proactive Monitoring. Normally, an operator watches the screen if something goes wrong, you know, alert goes off, hey, I know there's something wrong. No one, no admin, is looking at studio or scope or whatever day by day, right? They just open it sometimes, they'll watch it, but no one's watching this proactive alert. So wouldn't it be nice if there's, if there's something happening that we're actually getting notified the way we want to? So with this proactive notification, which is now available in Director 7.7 and up, I think it's also 7.8 and 9, we could send an email, which is great. If long duration is too long, or if we see CPU usage is too high, you know what, let's send an email. It's nice, but it's still pretty useless. Because no one's checking their phone constantly, do I have an email? So it's a good step. Some do. <laughs> <laughs> There's always an exception, and usually it's Esther. Could be, yeah, still. Yeah. Um, so good. It's, it's, it's a good start. But if we combine the record with Octoblue, we can also send that email, or actually a webhook, to Octoblue. And Octoblue takes this information and combines it to, bless you, to a siren, which is connected to um, in the office. Or you got a field of view line, which goes to red, because there's something wrong. Or you can connect it to, uh, for instance, PagerDuty. And PagerDuty is a service which is not built by servers. It's not maintained. We, we have no direct relationship with PagerDuty. But what they do is, it's a service for people who are on call, right? And if you're on call, you're getting a text, or you're getting a push notification. And all these things, we don't have to build. Citrix does not need to build it because there's someone else who's better at it. So just having a uh, proactive alert, like hey, there's something wrong, you can connect it to any way of notification, notification that you want. And that's a small example of what you could do. And a demo, I did not prepare, so I'll just go through it. And a workflow is pretty easy. This is all you have. Right? This is the way it looks in Octopus. Just a simple message coming in, send an SMS, send a direct message or turn on a pager or whatever, it's really easy, okay? More relevant, maybe more relevant, more public. When I come into the office in the morning, the first thing I do is pull up my car, swiping my RFID back saying, you know what, please open the room, what's it called, parking lot thing, and I can enter my car. Same thing when I enter the door for uh, the company. I need to swap my RFID badge, and the door is unlocked, I can come in. Well, that's really great. It's good technology, it's good access control. Why doesn't it automatically start my VM? Why doesn't it automatically assign me one of those locations, one of those uh, flexes, which is open, which is available? Uh, we can do so much more by me being in the office, and the system can be way much more smarter, for instance, by getting me a cup of coffee. That's connected to here as well. So, this is what thinking. I build a demo with an RFID badge. But why would I want to bring an RFID badge if I've got this? I've got a phone. And let me show what I'm doing. I'll just give for us pretty soon. <coughs> let me make it bigger. It's a small screen. This is my phone. Right. So what happens when I enter the building and I've configured my phone to be an iBeacon? Right. It's got Bluetooth, it can send out a beacon. So when I turn on the beacon, what will happen is, one, this light goes to red. So there is, for example, a desk now reserved for me. So we've got all flex seats, this seat is for me. What also happens in the background, and something I really wanted to show you, 
but you all decided that I should upgrade my Zen Surfacings 5 to 7. <laughs> <laughs> and it broke. <laughs> so I recorded the video in advance. What you can see is, it was too soon. Let me go back. It's too soon. It's not going to be here. If you have a shutdown, right? What you'll see happen is, whenever I turn on the beacon, this one will start pulsing. I've seen there's a beacon coming, and it's me. They will send a flow saying, hey, there's a beacon. Turn on this LED to red, and start the VM. <coughs> Right? So blinking, start VM, and what you see happening is the VM is actually starting. So with a really simple flow, just seeing, hey, I am here, I'm in the office, please start up my VM. There's no need to put all this hundred of VMs sitting and waiting for people to log on if I'm not in the office, unless I work at home. That's another example. Right? So that's pretty easy. We can do that. Whenever I leave the building, to the green again. The same applies for, let's say, a doctor who goes into a treating room. Whenever he's in the treating room, that room is occupied. And there is a big red light on top of the door, which goes to red. And it's just a metal switch. We can automate pretty easily by just having a beacon in his, in his phone. Whenever he enters the building, or whenever uh, he enters the, uh, the room, that light goes to red. And we know exactly, hey, this doctor is now working in this patient. So we were helping this doctor with one, focusing on his job, and two, he doesn't have to forget. So that way we are optimizing his workflow instead of thinking about automating an installation. Right? <coughs> so a beacon could be very powerful, or an air fight event. So what we just did is, whenever a beacon comes in, yes, we're opening the door, that's what it should do, or what an air fight event, but we're also expanding the workflow from just opening the door to booting up a VM, and probably more. And as you see, pretty easy flow. Who of you has seen Citrix Secure Forms already? Or Works Forms? A few. Secure Forms is one of the productivity applications which is available in XAML. Secure Forms basically is an application which shows you a form, as the name implies. And probably it's secure, so we had to rename it from Works Forms to Secure Forms. This is the composer, just drag and drop. What I want to do is, I want to provide a doctor a form so that whenever he visits his patients, he can ask them, what is your pain level? Right? Maybe the doctor doesn't do it, but the nurse maybe does it. What is your pain level? because that's important to know. Once in a while you need to check that with certain patients. So we build a form for this doctor, handed out this form. Where is it? There it is. So this is your forms. And I'm asking him, can you please ask every patient about his pain level? And what you can see what he's doing is asking me to automatically fill in the form which is presented. The reason is, this little device, this is the HDX Ready Pi, thin pi which we um, introduced during Synergy last month. Last month, yes. Two weeks ago. <laughs> and by the way, to correct what Andrew said during the session where I was not allowed to interrupt because of this man, <laughs> Citrix is not selling this device. Boosh! Citrix is not selling this device. It's few Sony. Citrix is literally not making any money out of this. <coughs> Bullshit. <coughs> Warren. Even Warren doesn't believe it. <laughs> but it's true. So this device, it's it's a thing plan. Okay? It's a good alternative. It's, customers that are having choice uses. But this device has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on it. And because it's got Bluetooth, it can also send out an IP. <coughs> In this case, it's got no power, so it's magic. But I configured my Mac to send out a beacon. So whenever a doctor goes to a patient bed, or a nurse, and asking, hey, what is your pain level? I need to know who he is, or who he or she is, because I need to know who's the patient. So all I have to do is say, well, automatically fill in this data. And the only thing which is a variable is the pain level. 
I cannot automatically fill that in. Right? So the name of the patient, his ID, the location, this is all really relevant. But I do not want the nurse, the nurse or the doctor to fill that in every time she visits the patient because it's a waste of time. So you combine a combination of a beacon and secure forms, that's being optimized. Next thing is, uh, by the way, this is some international standard. If you read it, you can feel the pain increasing. <laughs> Literally, I was just typing this and it started to hurt. <laughs> but I did. I configured Secure Forms to do a upload to your upload. It's uploading this structured data, again, the JSON file, to Octobloom. And due to the Wi Fi, it might take some time. <laughs> See, it's a live demo. What will happen is, this goes to Octoblue, it's taking this information and it's looking at what number did I provide. If it's less than five, I'll just add a message to Slack because that's where I want to collect the data. I know a doctor won't use it on Slack, but we can do it. Good. What you've seen is, there's now data in Slack coming in. And again, Slack was never made for Octoblue or for secure forms or the other way around. What I also did is, what I configured is, if the pain level is higher than five, which is pretty intense, I'm adding a notification for actually an incident in pager duty. So whoever is on call, whatever doctor is on call, he needs to know that the pain level is pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> Don't miss it. This <laughs> It could be, but I hope that if someone says I'm in intense pain, someone is involved. <laughs> so again, this is this is not from Zephyrus. We don't want to build this. They don't have to type in any information about a patient. They don't have to do an analysis like, hey, I put it in a paper, I'm going to you know, uh, my office, calling the doctor saying, well, she's really in pain, or get away from the golf course because she's really in pain. They already know. They are on call. So they, all the entire workflow is being optimized using, using IT. And that's relevant because we work with in healthcare. And they're asking us to make our work better, make our lives better. And that's what we do with, with those solutions. So again, uh, pretty straightforward workflow, drag and drop, uh, all you see is stuff. <coughs> Who of you have seen the session last November, I guess, about the remote desktop analyzer? Very cool uh, community tool by Barry Schiffer and uh, Ron Bolt. This is the wrong desktop analyzer. Basically what it does, it shows you what protocol am I using, what encoder am I using, what's the de all the details about the remote desktop is. This is great for an admin to change uh, the encoder, change all the details, and see what happens with the visual quality, but also with the frames, etc. So this could be very useful if you have access to the keyboard and mouse, if you are actually an admin. And you could wonder how adaptive is the HGX? Do you need to change this as an app? Um, so couldn't we just make this more, let's say, user friendly, more accessible, while this session might be running on a big screen or somewhere or the machine where I can access? So I, what I've set up is again. The same big buddy video everyone is showing. Okay, your forms. Wouldn't it be nice if I can use secure forms to change the characteristics of my session while the video is playing? So let's say this is now we're using pure X264 echo, right? The video. What happens if I'm using ThinWire plus Snowball or whatever we're calling it these days? 
and see what happens with the decision without me actually going to the decision and changing it in here. And it should be pretty fast and smooth. And it's done already. Right. But it's required. It's not just a pure edge where it will change to the actual one. Mm -hmm. That's the more plus. Oh, yeah, that's the right thing. more plus. So I made use of your forms. Again, this is a mobile product. It was never made to change the ATX to change things within an HX issue. While this is an admin solution, and you don't want to give this to your <coughs> but there are occasions where you want to give this to an end user, because there's always an exception. As Esther just pointed out, there's always an exception. And maybe you want this user to have really much control of their HX session. Maybe you want to give this user the ability to choose for 8 bits pixels instead of 24 during a session. It's an edge case. But you can do it. So using Octoblue as orchestrator, secure forms, put the data in, but we can control things within the session. And it will have to change. Usually when you go to 8 bits, I mess up my session. So you can do things which you should not do. Hey, it works. Even on this Wi-Fi, the HD video is playing, so that's pretty impressive. <coughs> So we can put the user in control of his own experience. We can make use an admin, make it easier to change those dynamics when you've got a remote user. While well, I work for Citrix, this is not a supported solution, so don't try that at all. But this could be useful, because this way, we're putting the power back in the hands of the user. So one last demo which I prepared, which was supposed to be funny because case should be in the room. In every data center, you've got those bottles of gas. Right? Whenever there's fire, these things will ensure that well, it remains a small fire and fire goes up, problem is resolved. But the problem which isn't resolved is that all machines go to hell. Those machines are either broken or at least shut down. You can't use them. Your entire data center is out of operation. This is a trick. And we probably have this system hooked up to some way of some sort of notification. But we might want to go one step further and actually controlling this notification, integrating it into the other systems that we've got. And maybe there's one or more machines running which are actually really important. I don't want them to shut down. I want to have, to have them run somewhere else because maybe my SQL cluster is high available. But I do have a few machines which simply are not high available. It's one system, and that's what we've got. So wouldn't it be nice that in case of a fire, yes, put it in that whenever there's a flame detected, I'm going to inform the operators and actually migrate the VMs. Because migrating a VM, that's pretty easy. If your sensor host isn't dead, that's my is today. <laughs> And Alice told me not to use fire, so I brought fire, and I did. <laughs> this is not staged at all. But what I'm going to show you is that whenever this device, which is just a plain, simple Arduino with a flame sensor, whenever there's a flame detected, it will notify the admins I might put it here because as you can see, this end server is on fire. Yeah, it's not good. It needs to go to this end server, which is okay. <coughs> so, this is not staged, okay? So, there's a fire. Pretty good. Let's see what happens. <laughs> it's migrating. And it's on the right end server. And now it's okay. But, more has happened. <coughs> it's not just the V-motion or live migration which we can do. This flame sensor actually triggered patient treatment. <coughs> if it's actually being triggered in time. So using IoT, we can optimize workflows which we normally would have considered 
out of our comfort zone, or maybe not our comfort zone, but out of our span of control. We should not think about those particles. Um, you know, the flame sensor or whatever detection there is to uh, detect there's a fire data center, that's not your duty, that's not your day job. What is your day job is to ensure that your users can use these applications. So you're actually, it should be interesting for you to know when there's a fire, so that you know the data center is out and I need to do some stuff to get to work again. And demo's failing, but that's what happens. Have you slept? As you can see, <coughs> data center's on fire, it has happened a few times, it used to work, but not today. So from a flame sensor into informing operators, going to pager duty, going to whatever service you have to inform operators, and actually migrate those VMs out of your data center. You don't want to migrate your, migrate your entire data center because most of your components are high available. But these VMs which are not high available, get them out. It's really easy to do, it's just the PowerShell command let it's, it's, it's one way to automate. We've been doing it for years. But now we can think about automating processes which are outside of our normal day job. So what I want to ask you to do, final thoughts, you can be the hero of the office. You can be the hero of the customer, okay? You can make their lives better by thinking outside of the box. I'm asking you not to read it. So start thinking outside of the box. Don't think in, I cannot do this, or this can be done because there are limitations. There are things which are out of my control. Don't think about automating the data center, which we've been doing for years, thinking about how can I optimize workflows. Go visit a doctor, go visit a, a one of your customers, and stay there for a day, walk with them, see what they're doing. And very important, be lazy, and think, can I automate this? And especially when you're going <coughs> to a customer, or even in the office, read a kit, if you don't have one, borrow one, the reason is, five minutes, very good. The reason is, though my kid is still pretty small, I know children always ask you, why? Why are you doing this? And while that's pretty annoying, get right. They're challenging you. And if you start thinking like a kid, especially in IT, you start thinking, why am I doing this? Why can I do this a little bit different than I've always been doing? Because we're used to it. This is the way it's always been. And the older you get, the more you start thinking, that's the way it is. Children don't have this limitation. They always challenge you and say, why? That's a good reason to bring a kid to work and let them see what they come up with, right? Or if you're lucky enough to start thinking at it as a kid and you'll come up with solutions. Last thing, um, Cypress Cloud, no longer works with Cloud, there's the lab section. In the lab section, there, you click on there, click on labs, you can see that one of the sections in there is IoT automation. IoT automation is a free service which is based on Octoboo. If you click on that, you'll see there are sections, and in these sections you will find blueprints. All you have to do is click on automate, and you can use those workloads. Predefined, pre-populated, all you have to do is run, run through the wizard, and you can use those Workloads, for instance, starting a meeting when you're ready to a beacon. So automating your uh, meeting room. Or check your SSL settings, your SSL grade. Am I still secure according to SSL apps? There are a lot of things which we can automate, which we're taking for granted. This new service in Citrix Clouds allows you to use it pretty easily. It's pretty easy to deploy. More, I'd like to challenge you to come up with new workloads, to come up with new of those. <coughs> because these are all ideas either from us, from Citrix, from Octavo team, but also from the community. Actually, most of the ideas are coming from the community. So we need you to come up with, uh, with ideas. So here's one, I want to steal your brain. Come up with ideas which either we should build or others should build, contribute, get your blueprints in there and let other customers use it. Because we can automate so much more, we can improve so much more workflows than just the workflows which we know about the last years. So I'd like to thank you for being here, listening, um, 
and I've got time for questions. So if anyone, Jordan. So probably one of the biggest challenges for your enterprise, yes, it's a free lab service today, but long term, what's packaging pricing going to be? Good question. <coughs> we don't know. So not no problem, we don't know. I agree. So for now, it, it is not monetized at all. It's free. <coughs> Being veg, that's good. It's free. But we don't know. Anyone else? 